On the Aztec Sports Network, welcome to the Rocky Long Coaches Show, brought to you by Bank of California. Bank of California is proud to be the presenting sponsor of Aztec Football. San Diego County Toyota Dealers, we've got what it takes. Miller Lite, great beer, great responsibility. And by LG, you gave a right. It's all possible with LG. Now, it's the Aztec Coaches Show. Here's your host, John Cantera. And good evening and welcome to the Coach Rocky Long Show. Coach John Cantera with you from now until 8 o'clock. And want to remind everyone, starting next Wednesday night, which will be October 1st, the Rocky Long Show will air every Wednesday night on the Mighty 1090 from 7 to 8, so make a note of that. But tonight we're here at ESPN 1700. Aztecs coming off a, a tough one last Saturday night up at Research Stadium against Oregon State. They got knocked off 28-7. to 7. This week, the Mountain West Conference opener, Saturday, 5 o'clock, Qualcomm Stadium, UNLV coming to town. And by the way, still uh, plenty of great tickets available for the ball game. And again, uh, Saturday, 5 o'clock conference opener. The first 20,000 fans through the gates will receive a We Are Aztecs blanket sponsored by Bank of California and the Associated Students. Tickets for the game start at only $16 to purchase tickets. You can call 619-283-SDSU. Again, that's 619-283-SDSU. Or you can log on to GoAztecs.com. We're joined right now by head coach Rocky Long and Coach Long, uh, a pretty miserable night up there in Corvallis last Saturday night. To say the least, Coach, uh, I thought we'd go up there and play really well, and we started out really well, so I thought things were going to be fine, and then we kind of went into a funk, or you have to give them credit. Uh, they started playing a little bit better, and eventually they played better than we did and won the game. Well, let's talk about uh, the positive, that first drive of the ball game. You guys went down there and uh, – Made some things happen, but that was kind of the, the high point of the evening offensively. No, it was exactly. I, I thought the coaches did a great job of scheming that opening drive. Uh, we started with a reverse because everybody on their team was chasing Pumphrey on the on the lead play, and the reverse got about 36. Uh, we threw a little flea flicker and probably should have caught it for a touchdown but didn't, and then we got back into our regular game plan and actually ran the ball well and got it down there and scored. Let's talk about the uh, the offense overall. Uh, and again, I'm sitting in my living room watching the ball game, and you know, I thought the offensive line really started to struggle. And I know Quinn Kaler did not have a great night. He threw a couple of more interceptions, but from what I could see on television, at least, Coach, and you're on the sidelines, he was under a lot of heat most of the night. You're right, exactly right. I uh, <clears throat> on the sidelines, it's hard to tell sometimes. And I, I thought that uh, after the game, but after I watched the film, I thought the offensive line blocked for the running game fairly well. Uh, we got some consistent yardage in the running game, so I, I thought they were physical and and knocked them backwards and opened up some holes for our running backs. But as far as pa uh, pass protection goes, we made some assignment errors, and then when we didn't make assignment errors, we weren't physical enough. We weren't stopping them at the line of scrimmage. And Quinn was throwing a lot of passes uh, right before he got hit or with people in his face. And uh, even great quarterbacks have a tough time when that happens. You know, I thought on the touchdown run, uh, Nico Saragusa really laid a, a beautiful block. He was pulling from his guard spot and really got to the inside shoulder, I think, of the linebacker. It was picture perfect. Yeah, a lot of the running game was that way. I, I thought we were physical up front and we knocked them backwards. We opened uh, the one you're talking about. Uh, he could have walked in. I mean, right. there's no one within reach of him, and that's because the offensive line knocked them all back into the end zone. But uh, our pass protection really needed uh, to be better than it was for us to compete at that level. What What's the problem with the pass protection? I mean, last year you guys uh, pass protected pretty well early in the year, I think, for the most part. Maybe uh, at a point in time in that second half against North Carolina, it broke down from time to time. But what seems to be the biggest issue? All right, well, I, I said we made some assignment errors. I, I don't know what the biggest issue is because we're big enough and strong enough up there. Maybe we're just so unsure of our protection schemes when they start twisting and stunning and all that, that, that we're being a little bit soft, waiting for people to come to us. And, and you do retreat and pass protection, but when you figure out who you're supposed to block, you have to be aggressive and attack them and, and strike them and keep them away from the quarterback. And, 
Uh, we were kind of letting them get into us before we'd figure out who we were supposed to block. They were into us, and now they had the leverage. They had the momentum heading back to the quarterback. Coach, uh, from a, a coaching standpoint, obviously you can go back to the drawing board and do a lot of recognition work that you do each and every week leading up to a ball game. But what else can you do uh, to work with that offensive line to, to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Well, uh, you know, we go against each other in practice some. Uh, we go, I think today we went 20 minutes against each other, and we made 15 minutes of it all pass, so it was team pass. And on defense, we, we blitz a lot and stun a lot, but we don't really twist off our defensive linemen very much. So this week we put in some line stunts uh, on our defense uh, with some twists and turns and inverts and all those kind of things. And so when we went against each other this week, we ran those. Our, our first team and second team defense ran those. Now, we probably don't run them as good as guys that run them all the time. Uh, but the speed of the first and second defense is a lot better than the scout team, so hopefully that will help for this week. All right. Uh, I, I know you guys went with a different center last week. He made his first collegiate start, Lenicio Noble. Zach Dilley had been the starter, and, of course, the returning starter, Jordan Smith, lost that number one spot prior to coming into the season. Where are you at that position right now? That seems to be the, the one area of concern. Well, it's the one area that we haven't been consi- getting any consistent performance, and and uh, all three of them have some talent, but they're kind of hot and cold now. Lenicio, through uh, competition and practice, won the job last week and actually played pretty well. I mean, uh, a little bit better than we expected, even though he blew one assignment on a pass protection that ended up uh, getting our quarterback sacked. Uh, the rest of the time he was aggressive. He knew what he was doing. He was physical at the line of scrimmage. Uh, he had a pretty good game, so he'll start this week. And it's always healthy to have good competition mm-hmm. at every position, And but I would just as soon one guy would establish himself. Danell Pumphrey, uh, 17 carries, 89 yards. He had the touchdown, also had a couple of catches for 14 yards. It looked like he's being pretty patient and looking for that hole. He, he's a good running back. I mean, he, he's got quickness and speed, so he can – he can outrun you if he gets in the open field. He can make you miss uh, in the open field as well as make you miss inside quite a bit. And he runs the ball really, really hard. Now, he doesn't pack much of a wallop because he only weighs about 175 pounds, but uh, he will dip his shoulder and try to run over you too. He, does, he doesn't take a beating. Now, we, we try not to run him inside too often uh, because of his size. We'd rather have him in the open field where he can make people miss and outrun him out there. You know, you guys really, uh, it ended up, you guys really didn't have the ball all that long in that game. Yeah, there, there's reasons for that. I mean, <laughs> if you don't get first downs, if you have a lot of three and outs, you don't you don't get many plays. And if the other team uh, has uh, some consistent drives, uh, they get the ball more. And we had way too many three and outs. And they had a couple, three long drives uh, that kept the ball away from us. Uh, and that's the way it works. I mean, in order to get a bunch of plays, you you got to get first downs. Lloyd Mills, uh, three catches, 35 yards, had that nice uh, run for 36. Also had a couple of punt returns, totaled 22 yards. Uh, how did he do as far as running his route and staying disciplined? Well, you know, he, he did okay. Uh, I, I think that's the biggest concern we have. I, I actually believe our offensive line will get better. I think we'll be better this week in the offensive line. I, we're too big, too strong, too talented up there not to be good in the offensive line. Uh, I, I think the biggest concern we have right now is, is our young receivers. I, they're so inconsistent, and, and I hate to keep saying the thing. They're very talented, but talent, talent doesn't get it done all the time. They're, they're inconsistent. I mean, they'll make a great play one minute and, and the next minute run the wrong route because they read the coverage the wrong way or uh, run a route at, a, at uh, it's supposed to be at 12 yards. They cut it off at nine. And, and so it makes it very uneasy not only did Quinn – have pressure in his face, it makes it very uneasy for him where he doesn't have at least one guy he can go to that he knows is going to be in the right place all the time. So they have to step up. Uh, for us to be the kind of team we'd like to be and compete for the conference championship, go to a bowl game and all that, right now our receivers, our young receivers, have to step up and play like veterans. You know, Coach, it's kind of funny when I go around town, people, uh, they always think that I have all the answers uh, 
uh, whether it be uh, the Chargers or the Padres or the Aztecs. And I had a gentleman approach me today when I was in a convenience store going, hey, what's going on with the Aztecs? What's going on? How come they're not throwing the ball and having success with it? And I go, well, their number one guy's out, and their number two guy, Eric Judge, is probably getting a little bit different coverage uh, now that Ezell Ruffin's out. And let's talk about Eric Judge. He had a couple of catches the other night for 15 yards. Are they covering him different now that Ezell's out? Well, I think Ezell was uh, demanding some double teams. And uh, Eric Judge hasn't done enough yet to demand double teams. Uh, what he has to do is start getting open now. He's probably, I don't know, I mean, they're all young, but he has more experience because he played quite a bit last year than most of the other ones do. Uh, he has great speed and quickness, and he's got pretty good hands. Um, he has to get himself open and be in the right place at the right time and start making some big plays. And then he might demand that kind of coverage, which would open up some of the other guys. Now, right now, I would say that, that we have a concern with our young uh, receivers, and if they don't step up we're going to be struggling but uh we have faith that they'll step up i just hope it's this weekend let's uh talk a little bit about quinn kaler he's obviously had uh, two very difficult ball games back to back against north carolina and the other night basically because he was under a lot of heat but i know he's uh had a thigh bruise a little bit of a strain of an mcl uh how's he uh, performed this week and has he been able to do everything in practice that you would like yeah he, he's done everything in practice he's wearing a brace on the knee uh, his thigh bruise is completely gone. Uh, he doesn't feel it anymore. Uh, the knee does not bother him at all. Uh, the brace is uh, uh, for protection as as well as to stabilize his knee and make him feel, you know, strong. Uh, he's he's taken every rep in practice that the first offense has taken. Um, I think he's had a good week of practice. Uh, now, most of that's against scout team. And our offensive line blocks the scout team very well. But if our offensive line can protect him, I think he's going to have a great game. Um, for, from your standpoint, I, w- I want to go back to that game uh, at, at halftime. What did you tell the team at halftime? I, I told them that uh, obviously we could compete with them. It wasn't a talent issue. Um, I thought that uh, we had some penalties that uh, helped them on their last drive that gave them a seven-point lead going into halftime. Uh, I told them that we had lost momentum when we had scored first, and then we punted, and they fumbled, and we had the ball. Uh, we went out in the second play on second and 13. We throw an interception, so we lost the momentum there. And right now, because of our pass protection, uh, they had the momentum. So we had to go out there and take away the momentum. And then in the third quarter, I actually think that was the biggest play in the game as far as momentum goes and keeping us in the ball game. Uh, in their very first drive of the second half, they had gotten a first down or two. They were about midfield. We had them third and eight. We blitzed. They didn't pick up the blitz. We had a guy come completely free, and he missed the quarterback. And the quarterback scrambled out of there, threw a ball to a late receiver. Receiver got about 16 or 17 yards and got a first down. They went down and scored then, and it was now 21-7. to And I, I think if we'd have sacked them there, I think we would have had the momentum back in our favor, and it would have been a great game. You know, I thought in the first quarter especially, uh, their offensive line had no idea what you guys were doing defensively. There were a lot of guys coming uh, untouched uh, after Mannion. And to Mannion's credit, you know, a few times he was able to avoid it. But I think also, and again, I don't have the ability to go back and look at film, you know, over and over and over, and you know what you called and you know what you were expecting. Guys a lot of times came in and they didn't break down and they just ran right by him. Well, yeah, that, that happened several times, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm glad you saw that. A lot of people didn't see that. Uh, you know, um, you always get criticism when you lose. You even get criticism when you win sometimes, <laughs> but you always get criticism when you lose. And uh, there was a couple things that were mentioned to me, uh, you know, about we didn't get any heat on the quarterback. Well, we sacked him three times, and we actually hit him or had pressure on him more than they had pressure on Quinn. Now, uh, he's an NFL-type quarterback. He's big, strong. He can look over the top of you. You can be hanging on to him, and he can still throw the ball and throw it pretty accurate. So you have to give him a lot of credit. He, he's a great player. But actually, on defense, we kind of the game plan worked really, really well. You know. And then they also said, well, they ran the ball on you. Well, and then when I looked at the stats after the game, they did run the ball a little bit. They didn't get 100 yards, and they averaged 2.7 yards a carry. So I guess they did run the ball, but 2.7 yards a carry is not very good. 
But, hey, Coach, it was one of those games, you know, and, again, you're coaching, you're in the heat of battle, and I'm sitting there watching it, and I kept saying, hey, the Aztecs are going to get going here. They can move the ball on this team, and then it just didn't happen. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't – I, you know, you know a lot of momentum. There's a lot of momentum factor. There's a lot of rhythm to, especially offensive football. Once you once you get things clicking and you you got the rhythm going and you're snapping the ball on time and everybody's doing the right thing, it gets much much easier. I I never saw us other than the very first drive of the game. I never saw us get into rhythm out there. In fact, we had three terrible penalties. I mean, there were some penalties that caused them to get touchdowns and keep drives alive but I'm talking about our delay of game penalties you know one of them was on the coaching staff that's our fault two of them were Quinn took too much time trying to change the play or the protection and that should never happen I mean that and one of them was on a promising drive too coach uh, you know when I'm watching the game the other night and I'm watching the defense I really thought the defense at times played really really well they kept getting the ball back yeah they they had some penalties and they were able to capitalize on it but overall I thought the defense really did a pretty good job considering well I I mentioned the one I I thought we we did a, a really good job until the last drive of the first half and then in the second half we gave them up two two straight drives for touchdowns but one of them was the one I just described. And, and you know, that sometimes you're going to miss the sack and sometimes you're going to miss a tackle. I was disappointed after we let them score that time. The next series of downs on defense, they marched the ball right down the field and scored again. And then all of a sudden after that, they got first downs, but they never even came close to scoring again. And so I, I was a little disappointed the way we finished the half and the way we started the second half. How about as far as guys that you thought had pretty good games on defense? Well, I, I thought our safeties uh, played much better. I mean, I think our safeties have made progress each week. And so I thought they I thought they played pretty well. Um, I thought our linebackers played okay. Our defensive line was okay. I, I didn't uh, – now our corners have gotten beat the last two weeks now against good receivers and good quarterbacks. But we, we've given up a couple, couple three long passes that I actually didn't think this year we would give up because I thought our corners were pretty good. Now, that means we're going to have to give them more help than we've given them to this point, which will maybe make us not quite as good at getting to the quarterback. But we can't be giving up 92-yard touchdowns and 70-yard plays. You know, that, uh, I think, coming off a, a bye, I think uh, for you and the coaching staff, you're probably very disappointed on how the team, you know, played overall. Uh, and, again, you got to score more than seven points nowadays in college football to win a ball game. But how about as far as practice? How have the guys bounced back this week in practice getting ready for the Mountain West Conference opener? Well, uh, we've had our second long practice today. We had one yesterday and today, and I, and I thought the – Attitude was good. I, I think that they're, they've been at practice. I think they've worked hard. I think they've had a little more serious attitude this week uh, than, than, than they did last week. And sometimes when you get a bye week, you practice too much on a certain team. They get a little bored and a little antsy about things. And, and last week, uh, we didn't get to practice like we normally do. I mean, it was so hot. Uh, we took a couple breaks. And then when we got out to practice, I think it was on Tuesday. It might have been Wednesday, but on Tuesday – then we had that thunderstorm and lightning. So normally when we practice about two hours, we got about 45 minutes of practice in that day. And I, and I, uh, you know, I sound like a coach now. Huh. I, I think that, I think that matters. I think if you don't get the full practice time that you normally get, I think you're not as well prepared for the game. Well, I think that's uh, pretty much uh, right on. And I also think when you've got uh, certain groups on your team that are extremely young and inexperienced, every minute you can be out on that field is critical. I, I agree with you. Well, we're going to take phone calls tonight. If you'd like to uh, dial us up, our number in San Diego, 866-405-1717, 866-405-1717. And again, next Wednesday night, October 1st, the Rocky Long Show will be on the Mighty 1090. It will air between 7 and 8 o'clock. We'll take a quick timeout. We'll come back more with Coach Rocky Long right here on ESPN 1700. Welcome back to the Coach Rocky Long Show. John Cantero, we're with you until 8 o'clock. And again, uh, next Wednesday night, we'll air on the Mighty 1090 from 7 to 8. Coach, where do we catch you tonight? You sitting in your office breaking down a little uh, game tape in between uh, commercials? Uh, you're right. I'm in my <laughs> office, and uh, before we got on the air, I was watching the practice tape. And uh, what goes on after we get off the air? 
Well, I have to finish watching the practice tape before I go home. What's a typical day for Rocky Long on a, on a Wednesday? Oh, get in here about 7 o'clock and leave about uh, – it'll probably take me another hour after we get off the air. So I'll probably get out of here about 9. Now, you look at both offense and defense every day? I study the defense and I rush through the offense. Rush through the offense. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Coach, I wanted to ask you just something, you know, as a football fan, and uh, the last few years have come up with this rule, uh, uh, the targeting penalty, where a guy, you know, he gets a penalty and uh, he gets ejected, and they can look at the tape and see if it was really that bad. Uh, and then he, uh, if he, uh, it was bad, he, he's out of that ball game, he's out of the half the following week. What are your thoughts on this targeting penalty? Well, I, I wish they would have eased into it is what I think. And and I think it's probably uh, good for football that we start teaching people a different way to block uh, for or tackle, block and tackle for for both sides of the ball. I, I think that uh, leading with your head's bad for the guy that's doing the hitting. Leading with your head's bad for the guy he's hitting. Um, I, I think that uh, – it, it's good for the game, but I wish they would have eased it in. I, I mean, I wish they would have said, okay, we're going to call them personal fouls. Uh, you're going to be put on whatever, probation or something, and if you get two of them in a game, then we kick you out. Or uh, after the game, we're going to v- review it again after the game because they are making some mistakes now. I mean, they're they're calling targeting penalties. When you watch it in slow motion over and over again, it's really not a targeting penalty. And they've already kicked the kid out of the game. And and sometimes they get reinstated for the next game, but sometimes they don't. Uh, they should review it on, you know, write it right there, right then, make a decision whether he's out or not. And the first one should just be a personal foul penalty. And the second one, okay, kick him out. You know, one of the things that I've seen, you know, uh, if a ball carrier is running and uh, another guy's coming in to, to tag him and that ball carrier, you know, at the last minute will, will spin a different way and almost go right into the guy that's coming after him. And uh, it's almost like that poor guy got set up to fail. It just happened to be that offensive player turned into him uh, at a different angle. I, I've seen many of those, too. You know, I, mean, I, I don't know who's the making the head-on-head contact when a running back is – running with the ball, and he dips. You know, he dips his shoulder pads, and he dips his head. And even though the defender's targeting was in the proper place at the chest or the waist when he started, when the running back comes down and dips, they end up shoulder-to-shoulder, head-to-head. Now, I haven't seen too many of them when it's been a running back. But what I've seen is quarterbacks that scramble that will take on a guy by dipping his shoulder and trying to run through him, and then the defensive guy gets called for a penalty as soon as he hits a quarterback. You know the other one that gets me, and we see it all the time. We see it on college football. We see it uh, on Sunday and Monday with the National Football League is when the running back will actually face mask the defender, <laughs> and, but they'll call face masking on the defender if he's trying to you know reach in there when he's getting face masked. Yeah, I, I agree. That, that happens all the time. Now, a guy will be running, and he'll try to stiff arm the defender who's trying to tackle him. He'll get up in his face mask, and he'll have a hold of his face mask. And the only thing the defender can do is now he can't dip on him to hit him, so he starts reaching for him, and a lot of times he'll grab the running back's face mask. They should be offsetting penalties, but they never call that on the running back. This whole game of football, I think whether it be in high school, college, pro, Everything right now, all the rules are, are benefiting the offense. Uh, eventually, they're going to have to do something because I think the fans are going to get tired of it. I, I agree. The rules are to benefit the offense. I, I think uh, under the guise of uh, safety, and I think a lot of the rules are good for safety purposes, but a lot of the rules um, are so the offense can keep the ball, they can score more points, they can gain more yardage. And I heard someone uh, say this the other day, a lot of it's for fantasy football. There's so many people involved in fantasy football. Uh, they want to have more and more stats, more scoring, more yardage running the ball, more yardage throwing the ball. Guys got 15 catches instead of 12. The one that I'm having the most trouble with is the interference calls. Yep. I mean, we, we got some interference calls the other night that last year they might have called, but they've been, they would have been very controversial. And this year it's an automatic. If you bump into a receiver now – it's an automatic interference call. Even if you touch the ball, even if you're going for the ball, they're, they're calling it interference right away. One, one the other night would have never been called last year. 
The other one would have been questionable last year. And and so it's making it almost impossible to be a defensive back. The one you're talking about, was that the one on Casey? The one on Casey down the long one down yeah. the sideline. Yeah. That that's questionable. It might have been called last year. It might not have been called last year. But this year it's called every single time. The one that shouldn't have been called is when they were in the back of the end zone when they had eight plays from about the eight-yard line, and they kept giving them penalties to give them a first down. And on third and four, we had a guy covered. Casey was in front of him, and it was a big tight end, and he went for the ball. The tight end went with, went for the ball. The ball was six feet over the tight end's head, right. and they called Casey for interference. Unbelievable. Yeah, and then eventually they scored. Yeah, well, you, you give a, a good offensive unit uh, uh, an ample opportunity to score. They're going to eventually score. I don't care if you got the uh, uh, the great uh, Bears defense uh, back in the 80s. And, you know, I mean, we're just seeing it really at all levels this year, the first few weeks of college football and even pro football, I mean, just a number of flags. I mean, it's really bogging the game down. I think it's slowing the game down. I think it's making the game less interesting. It's obviously making the game less aggressive. In fact, someone asked me the other day, well, it sure seemed like you got a lot of penalties. And and we kind of did. We we got uh, – Oregon State had seven. We had nine, okay? Nine penalties last year was a lot. This year it's about average because there's people getting 14, 15, 16 penalties in a game. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not been good for college football early start on. We're going to get to the bottom of the hour. We'll come back. We'll start taking a look at UNLV. And, again, the Aztecs Mountain West Conference opener – this Saturday, 5 o'clock, we'll tell you more about uh, getting tickets. We'll tell you about the, uh, the Aztec uh, Warrior Walk that's going to be coming down the pike at 3 o'clock. we got a lot to get to in the final half hour. This is the Rocky Long Show. John Cantera right here on ESPN 1700. Diego, Toyota, let's go places. As we continue on on a Wednesday night, the Coach Rocky Long Show, 7 to 8 on ESPN 1700. Next Wednesday night, we'll kick it over to the Mighty 1090 with the uh, final of Padre Baseball coming down the pike on uh, Sunday. So Coach Long will join me on my regular talk show next Wednesday night. That is October 1st from uh, 7 to 8. Coach, you got UNLV rolling in. They're uh, 1 and 3 right now, but uh, they put a pretty good uh, licking on you last year over there uh, at Sam Boyd Stadium. I'm sure you guys would definitely like to return the favor, and I'm sure the the players are probably, uh, the younger players are probably hearing it from the older players about what happened and how they're not going to allow that to happen again. Well, obviously the guys that were with us last year uh, remember uh, the game. I, I thought we played poorly, but you have to give them credit. I, I thought they played extremely well. Uh, they out physical us. They outperformed us. They out-executed us. They outdid us in every facet of the game. And, uh, and I know that the guys that were there remember that, and I think it probably still lingers with them. And, and if you're a competitor, uh, that makes you want to have another chance at uh, redeeming yourself. So I know the older guys understand all that, and the younger guys probably have the feeling from the older guys what happened last year. And uh, not only that, it's our first conference game. We'd like to compete for the conference championship, and and it's their first conference game too. And, and anybody that has struggled in preseason kind of counts the conference schedule as a reborn or a, a new season starting over again, and it's like a – a new birth to all of us, so I'm sure both teams will be excited. Both teams will get after it, and hopefully we execute better than they do. For the Aztec fans of me, I not know a lot about uh, this year's uh, UNLV Rebels. They, they are 1-3. and three. They got blasted in their first game at Arizona, 58-13. to 13. They defeated Northern Colorado, 13-12, uh, to 12, and then lost uh, to Northern Illinois, 48-34, to 34, and blown out last Saturday at Houston, 47-14. to 14. And I know they've been dealing with some injuries over there. What can you tell us about them uh, offensively? Well, I, you know, I, I've, I've heard about all their injuries, and I have no idea uh, who's playing and who's not playing. What I do know is they have a junior college quarterback that he transferred in there, very very similar to the quarterback last year. Uh, he throws the ball pretty well, is really gifted at getting out of trouble, can run with the ball. He makes a lot of plays with his feet. He, You know, when he gets out of trouble, he finds open receivers. Uh, so he, he's a tough guy to handle, a tough guy to keep in the pocket. 
their offensive line is big and strong, and almost all of them are back from last year. Their two tight ends are back from last year. Uh, most of the receivers are back from last year. And one of them last year had an uh, – I mean, he's a really good player. His name is Devontae Davis. He's six foot three. He's about 215 pounds. He runs fast. He jumps high. He's very, very physical. And last year, he intimidated our corners. Now, we probably should have given our corners more help than we did. But uh, I think he caught 14 passes for almost 200 yards and three or four touchdowns. So he actually dominated the game. He made the quarterback look good, and he dominated the game. So uh, on offense, they've been playing well. They've they've been gaining a bunch of yards. They've been scoring some points. And on defense, they've been struggling some. Coach, what do they uh, do offensively? I mean, what, what do they try to hang their hat on? They're a spread team, and so they run zone read. They run uh, stretch read, uh, and the quarterback's good enough. If you, if you start chasing the running back too hard, the quarterback's good enough to carry it himself. And then, obviously, they do all the things the spread do. They, they fake the zone read. They throw it down the field. Uh, they throw quick passes. They throw bubble screens. They throw hit screens. They throw slip screens. Huh. They use those bubble screens and all that kind of stuff as toss sweeps, just like a run and play, and see if you're good enough to tackle in the open field or run them down inside out. Uh, they do a pretty good job of protecting the quarterback, too. Uh, but if they don't, he seems to get out of trouble. He doesn't get sacked very often. I know it hasn't gone uh, the way Bobby Hawk would have uh, thought, and I'm sure uh, the Rebel fans thought when Bobby Hawk was hired here a few years back. But, you know, this guy, a pretty good football coach. I don't think there's any question about that. And, and I ask you this question because of your length of service in the Mountain West Conference at New Mexico and now at San Diego State. You've seen so many coaches come and go through UNLV in a variety of different ways from trying to recruit freshmen into their program to trying to go uh, JC. What direction has Coach Houck taken in his tenure there? Well, uh, Coach Houck, and I agree with you, I, I think he's a great coach. All you have to do is look at his, his record when he was at Montana, and Montana has a history and a, a tradition of winning, and he was in several playoff games and national championship games and all that. Uh, he, he's doing both. I mean, he's taking freshmen. Uh, he's taking quite a few transfers. Uh, what I think he's doing is the right thing. I, I think he's taking good kids. He's established a program that is very physical, very disciplined. Um, they play extremely hard. Uh, and now, now it's a matter of if he can get enough talent in there. I mean, a lot of, a lot of teams in the mountain West struggle with the same thing. And, uh, Sometimes you get exposed when you play, quote, quote, the Power Five conferences because the talent level is not the same, or at least the depth level is not the same, where the talent goes through the first, second, and maybe third team. A lot of uh, Mountain West Conference teams, including UNLV, uh, their starting 11 can play with anybody. What happens is you, you lose a guy or it's a uh, deal where it's hot or something, and, and the depth becomes a factor. Uh, you lose to teams that have more depth or more talent you know i think over the last several years you know coming back to san diego state i remember once upon a time i used to think they badly over scheduled and it, it, i look at your schedule this year north carolina is one of those games you got to play well you did you came up a little bit short oregon state i think that's a, a definitely a, a good matchup uh but what i'm trying to get to it looks like your schedule this year non-conference as you go into conference pretty balanced this year yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, I think that's the proper way to do things. I think you should schedule two teams where you're the favorite and two teams where you're the underdog because uh, if you're the favorite, it means people think you have more talent than the team you're playing. And if that is true, uh, it gives you a chance to work on some things. It gives you a chance to better your team and maybe get some confidence. And then uh, – when you have those teams, like I, I really believe we have a talent, enough talent on our team to compete with the Oregon States and the North Carolinas. But we're not to the point in our program yet where we've gone over the edge and beat them. Now, it's going to happen. And when we get to the point where even though we might be a little less talented and we are the underdog, but when we go play those kind of teams, we are going to beat them. And, and once you beat them once, beat them once on the road, it's funny psychologically how much easier it is to do after that. 
That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I want to remind everyone, uh, fans, don't forget the Warrior Walk. I was telling you about a little bit earlier. It's going to take place this Saturday, 3 o'clock. Be part of this tradition when the team walks into Qualcomm Stadium. Uh, you can meet right there, E3, F3 in the parking area. So be sure to be part of this fan-favorite event and cheer on the team as they prepare to take on the Rebels this Saturday in the Mountain West Conference. Till We'll take a quick timeout. We'll come back. We're going to the top of the hour. This is the Rocky Long Show on ESPN 1700. Welcome back to the Coach Rocky Long Show. I want to remind everyone you want to do game day right, do it with the latest innovations from LG. From the kitchen to the living room, LG has you covered. Come check out the latest in LG innovations at your local Best Buy, or you can check them out online at bestbuy.com slash LG. It's all possible with LG. Uh, Coach, uh, you guys got back what time uh, early Sunday morning? Uh, I think we got back to the office about 4 a.m. All right. What what does uh, Coach Long and his staff do? Uh, you guys go home for a few hours and come back. What do you do? Yeah, we go we go home and we're back in the office by 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, and then when you bring the players in on Sunday? Uh, they came in at noon, and uh, we watched the film uh, from the Oregon State game, and then we lift weights for an hour, and then we go on the field for about an hour. Where would you evaluate uh, this team compared to last year's team at the same point after three ball games? Well, uh, there, there's two ways to compare them. No, number one is we're not as mature. We're a lot younger football team. Uh, so you, uh, you're concerned sometimes about uh, how they're going to react when they haven't played well, and we didn't play well. So we're concerned about how they're going to act because of the maturity level. But the actual way they played on game day, we, we have played better this year in the first three games than we played last year in the first three games. Uh, I thought uh, last year we played poorly in the first game. We played um, poorly in the second game, but we played against a great football team in Ohio State. And then we played pretty good in the third game against Oregon State. And then we played poorly in the fourth game but found a way to win. And then after that, we started playing well. Uh, this year we we played well in the first game. We played well in the second game, even though we lost. We played well in the second game, and then we played poorly at Oregon State. So I think overall we played a little bit better this year in the first three games than we did last year. But the immaturity of our team uh, makes you worry about how they're going to respond. You know, I know coming into the year, uh, the first show you and I did, and even when you and I sat out at Petco Park one night and talked a little bit, it's been the secondary. Uh, and you've talked about it, the, you know, a few of the weeks that they are getting better. Uh, what has to, to get even a little bit better as the season goes on with that secondary? Well, the safeties have to continue to improve. I mean, I'm not saying uh, – I, I think they've gotten better each week, but they're not a finished product by any means. And, and we make some mistakes that cause us some problems. Uh, we don't get the, the corners help where they're supposed to get help. We don't always support the run at the right angles. Uh, but they've gotten better each week. In fact, they're tackling better. The first game they didn't tackle worth a darn. Since, since that uh, week, they've tackled pretty well the last two, last two games. And, and the man coverage skills are getting a little bit better. Uh, in the secondary, I think our corners uh, we think are really good. And I, and I still do think they're pretty good. But we completely isolated them out there, uh, and it's kind of hurt us a little bit. So we have to change some things in the secondary schematic-wise so that we can get the corner some help every once in a while. How about as far as depth uh, on defense? And, you know, when you're on the field a lot, or it doesn't really matter. I mean, college football now with spread to offenses that you're going to see on Saturday against UNLV, you got to develop those young guys as quickly as you possibly can to get them on the field. How do you feel about depth, uh, at, whether it be at D-line, linebacker, or the secondary? Well, I, I think the depth in the D-line is pretty good. Uh, and uh, we've got some experience up there. We have some young guys that back up. But we have experienced guys that start and young guys that back up. At linebacker now, we have experienced guys that start, and we have young guys that back up, and that that's pretty good. At corner, I think we have three quality corners right now. We have some young guys that might turn into really good corners. So right now we're alternating three guys in two corner spots. Uh, at safety, uh, at the strong safety positions, which we use two of them, uh, I think we have two quality guys right there, and we've got some young guys that aren't ready to play yet. So that that's a real concern. 
at our free safety position. We call it the Aztec position. We have two new guys to our program that have a world of talent, uh, and there's a good enough depth there, but they're not performing at the level we need them to yet. But there is depth. So the depth at corner is shaky. The depth at safety is shaky. Um on defense, the depth of D-line and linebacker are pretty good. When you're talking about the J.C. guys that came in and got good ability, but they're not performing at that level, is that a case not just understanding the defense and the complexities of it? That's totally the case. It's not athletic ability. It's not want to. Uh, it's just that when they get to this level, just like our guys that go into the NFL, they get they go from here to the NFL and they can't believe how complicated things are. <laughs> well, when you come from junior most junior colleges and high schools, you get into the Division One college ranks, and both sides of the ball, offense and defense, are so complicated to what you're used to. You can't play at full speed or you can't play to your ability because you're thinking too darn much. Rocky Long, of uh, course, will be uh, next. Uh... A Wednesday night on the Mighty 1090. We will air that show between 7 and 8 during my regular uh, talk show. Coach, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, injuries a little bit. And I wanted to ask you about Jake Feely just because living in North County, I've had a lot of people say, hey, what's going on with that kid from Oceanside, that big linebacker? And I know, uh, you know, he had a real severe neck injury. He did get a red shirt year for that, but he hasn't. Last I had heard, he had not been cleared. What is his status right now? Because, I mean, this guy has been a, a real key to your defense the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I think we'd be much better on defense if he was playing, too. But uh, you got to be careful, especially with head and neck injuries. you got to be very, very careful. Uh, he hasn't been cleared yet. Uh, he's out there at every practice. He's in good condition because we run the heck out of him. Uh, he never he never gets in any of the, the actual practice stuff where it's 11-on-11 11 11 or anything like that. He goes through non-contact drills. Um, he will be checked out again in three weeks. Uh, we think and we hope and he thinks and he hopes that after three more weeks he'll be cleared to play and he'll he be able to play in our last four games. Well, that would be great, and uh, hopefully a fifth game, which would be another bowl game. That would be nice. I'm counting on it, Coach. All right, Coach. <laughs> I'm definitely counting on it. I, I see better days ahead. I know last week uh, uh, really stung you and the staff and, and the players, but I, I see a lot of better days ahead. I think there's some talent on this team, and uh, I think these guys will rise to the occasion. We're going to take our final time out. We'll come back. We're going to get to the California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week as we continue on the Rocky Long Show right here on ESPN. 1700. The Coach Rocky Long Show here on ESPN 1700. We're going to get to the California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week and this week's outstanding athlete and they will uh, receive uh, uh, some nice uh, things from California Bank and Trust. The Athlete of the Week is women's swimmer Frida Berggren. This past Friday, San Diego State women's swim team defeated University of San Diego 33-24 to in the pentathlon of the Aztec uh, Aquaplex. For the second straight year, SDSU sophomore uh, swimmer Frida Berggren captured the individual title. Berggren was able to stay at the front of the pack for all five races, finishing no lower than fourth place in any event. Berggren finished first in the 100 butterfly, second in the 100 individual medley, third in the 100 backstroke, fourth in the 100 breaststroke, and fourth in the 100 freestyle. Berggren's total time over the five events was 4 minutes 54 30, finishing just ahead of teammate Anika Apostolin, who finished with a total of 455.41. Uh, what an outstanding effort. Congratulations to Frieda Berggren, this week's California tr uh, Student uh, Trust Athlete of the Week. And I got to tell you, Coach, after all that swimming, you had to take a nice long nap. I tell you what, if I had to swim and just cross the pool one time, I'd be worn out. Well, that's a, an impressive effort. Hey, let's uh, let's get back to the rest of the week. You guys went hard yesterday, today. Uh, uh, take us through uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, and up until uh, you guys walk uh, in the Aztec Warrior Walk at three o'clock. Well, tomorrow we only go for about an hour and fifteen minutes. Uh, we don't go in pads. We go in just helmets. Uh, we do about thirty minutes of the kicking game, and then. About 30 to 40 minutes, uh, we do offense, defense versus scouts. And, uh, and then we come up and meet. We meet before practice. We meet after practice. And then they come in, uh, I don't know, uh, in the late afternoon on Friday. 
We have meetings with them. We take them to the travel squad. We take to a hotel, stay overnight there, get them away from distractions, let them rest and relax. And then the next day we get up and we have meetings in the morning. We eat pregame meal about uh, 2 o'clock, and then we head to the stadium for a 5 o'clock game. All right. You mentioned the, the travel squad. Do you only take, what, 65 players at the hotel? We take 64. The league rule is 64 on the travel squad. I thought it used to be 65. They knocked a guy off, huh? Well, it's all. every <laughs> league has it differently. Some leagues have 70, and some leagues have 66. It's it's all determined by your league. All right. Well, hey, Coach, uh, best of luck. Uh, we're, we're counting on a, a Mountain West Conference opening win, and we'll have something good to talk about next Wednesday night and look forward to the following week. I appreciate it, Coach. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Coach Rocky Long, always a pleasure to do the uh, Coach Rocky Long show. And, again, next week we'll be back on the Mighty 1090. I'll have my regular show that gets underway at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock will be the Coach Rocky Long show. Now, I want to remind everyone – uh, that uh, the game is at 5 o'clock, so our pregame show, which will get underway on the Max FM 105.7 FM and ESPN 1700, that will get underway at 4 o'clock. Toe meets Leather at Qualcomm Stadium, UNLV, and San Diego State at 5 o'clock. And just remember, next Wednesday night we'll be taking a lot of phone calls on the Mighty 1090 for Coach Rocky Long between 7 and 8. Hope everyone enjoyed the show. Hope you have a great night. And, hey, go Aztecs!